hello, ladies and gentlemen, for one last time here in the era of World War I. In our studies of this conflict, we've spent roughly the last four historical years watching as Europe experienced the bloodiest and most destructive war in history up to that time. Now, we'll see that war coming to an end. Let's go to the essential questions. Remember when we left off last time, Russia had exited the war, but the United States had entered the war. We'll see how American involvement turns the tide of the conflict and leads to victory for the Allied powers. And we'll also see how the fighting comes to an end for each of the major central powers. You know, what events lead to their defeat. With the fighting then done, we'll look at the process of trying to make the peace. Uh, what peace plan does uh, Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, what does he put forward originally? And then how is that peace plan viewed by the other allied nations? Then we'll look at the peace conference that took place in Paris. Uh, who was there? Who wasn't there? And uh, we'll look at one particular treaty from that peace conference, the Treaty of Versailles, specifically because it deals with Germany. And we'll see how ultimately that treaty that was supposed to end the Great War, World War One, is really only going to lead to the start of another even more terrible war. So those are the essential questions. That's where we're headed for today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So we know Russia's withdrawal from the war is offset by the U.S. entering the war. When Russia backs out of the war, you know, when the communists win the uh, Russian Revolution and then take Russia out, uh, when they back out of the war, it's a huge blow to Allied morale. But when the U.S. enters the war, this is a big boost to Allied morale. The United States provides the Allies with much-needed industrial and human resources at a time when the Allied war effort is nearly completely exhausted. We have to keep in mind that the U.S. is declaring war in 1917. They don't even get into the war until 1918, and by that time the war has been going on for four years. So the Allies and the Central Powers are really worn down, really exhausted by that point in time. So the U.S. jumping in on the side of the Allies provides the Allies with stuff that the Central Powers don't have. Money, resources, weapons, and fresh bodies. And, and the Germans know this, okay? The Germans also know that they have a window of time before U.S. soldiers actually reach Europe. And they know that if they're going to win the war, they have to do it before U.S. soldiers arrive. So knowing that they have to get this done uh, before U.S. soldiers start arriving in Europe in early 1918, the Germans launch a final series of offensives in France. And by the summer of 1918, they have come within miles of the city of Paris. And it's becoming a very desperate situation for the Allies. The French army, tired and exhausted from fighting, uh, begins to mutiny left, right, and center with a number of soldiers simply abandoning the lines, creating these huge huge gaps in the, ally, uh, in the Allied lines, and the British, desperate to make sure the Germans don't exploit these gaps, launch their own counteroffensive to try to keep the Germans busy, and it really looks like everything's on the brink of collapse, but this is the moment at which U.S. soldiers finally begin to arrive in Europe. They plug the gaps left by the mutineering French soldiers uh, and are able to help the Allies stop the German advance literally within miles of the city of Paris. And honestly, that's the last thing the Germans have in the tank. They spent about everything that they had trying to end the war right there, and that's about all that they've got left. I mean, like we said, by now the war has been going on for four years. The French, the British, the German militaries, they've all sustained enormous numbers of casualties. They're running out of resources and supplies, and frankly, they're running out of warm bodies to put out on the battlefield. The Germans, for example, have seen the average age of their recruits dipping year after year after year in the war. By this point in time, it is not uncommon to find 14- and 15-year-old kids manning the trenches and the front lines for Germany. That's how desperate they've become. And whereas the Germans cannot expect any relief, fortunately for the Allies, they've now got a quarter of a million fresh American troops arriving in France every single month. And this is really the advantage that the United States brings. I wish that I could come in here and say, yes, America turns the tide of the war because they were better soldiers and had better strategy and our weapons did stuff that the other guys' weapons wouldn't do. And that simply wouldn't be true. The biggest advantage that the United States brings into this is freshness. They haven't been in the war for four years. We're showing up with soldiers who are well-supplied, well-fed, well-armed, high morale, ready to fight. We're showing up at a time when the other guys are near the point of complete exhaustion and we're fresh and ready to fight. So our freshness and newness to the conflict is the biggest advantage that we bring in for the side of the Allies. And as more and more fresh American troops are pouring into Europe, the Allies launch their own massive counterattack under the command of the French General Ferdinand Foch. And on the strength of the fresh 
ready American military forces, the Allies pushed the entire German army all the way back to their own border. And with their backs against the wall, by September of 1918, Kaiser Wilhelm's generals inform him that Germany simply cannot continue fighting and that there is no way that the war could be won. At this point, the Germans now begin to seek amicable peace terms, knowing that the war is not winnable and the collapse of the other central powers is at hand soon to follow. And we'll first look at the Ottoman Empire. The Allies, fighting alongside of Arabs under the command of a young British officer named T.E. Lawrence were finally advancing against the Ottomans in the Middle East. The British had tried to attack Asia Minor from the outside and that just didn't work out too well. So they kind of shifted strategies and they send in this young officer, T.E. Lawrence, uh, because he's got a great understanding and knowledge of Arab culture and language and his mission is to go in and convince the Arabs to rebel against the Ottoman Turks. And so the combination of the Arab rebellion uh, from the inside and the British attacking from the outside, the dual pressures finally lead the Ottomans to collapse, and uh, on October 30th, 1918, the uh, Ottoman Empire surrenders to the combined British and Arab force, knocking them out of the war. Less than a week after that, the Austrians surrender to the Italian army after the Italians defeat the Austrians at the major battle of Vittorio Veneto. So that's two down and uh, one to go. And as Germany is seeking favorable peace terms, we see the German army begin to disintegrate as well. Thousands of Germans, tired from the fighting, begin to either surrender or simply desert the lines. Morale in Germany is just plummeting and hitting an all-time low, leading to uh, uprisings all over the country against the Kaiser. And amid these uprisings in Germany as they get further and further out of control. On November 9th, 1918, Kaiser Wilhelm steps down. He abdicates from power and flees to Denmark. And the new government that's put in control, they immediately begin peace negotiations with the Allies. Two days later, on November 11th, 1918, Germany signs an armistice with the Allies and agrees to end the fighting. So after four years of bloodshed and death and destruction, the fighting in World War I is finally over. Now, an armistice does not end a war. It's just an agreement to stop the fighting. What we still need is a peace treaty, and that's the next step to the process. And with the fighting over, people are very anxious to reach that peace agreement. Now, even before the war had ended, a lot of people were focusing their attention for peace on kind of an unlikely source, and that was the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Earlier that year, uh, in uh, his State of the Union address for that year, Woodrow Wilson outlined a peace plan that had sort of 14 different bullet points. He called it the 14 points for peace, or the 14 points peace plan. And uh, his plan included things like international recognition of freedom of the seas and free trade, limitation on arms to kind of dial back militarism, an end to secret alliances, because that's kind of what pulled everybody into this fight. Wilson's plan also calls for just settlements of colonial claims to dial down some of the tensions dealing with imperialism, uh, the rights of self-determination for all peoples, uh, especially those who are living in the very soon to be collapsed empires. They should be able to vote and decide whether they want to become sovereign states or how they want to handle their new freedom. But Wilson's baby in all of this is the establishment of a general assembly of nations or something he called the League of Nations. What Woodrow Wilson envisioned was this sort of quasi-global governing body that would come together with representatives of all nations and when there was a major issue like say the one between Serbia and Austria they would come together work out their differences and reach a resolution without resorting to war. He wanted to have this thing that would settle future disputes peacefully. The League of Nations is, of course, the precursor to today's uh, UN or United Nations. So it's a very idealistic peace plan that is really amicable for everyone involved. And it sounds great coming from Woodrow Wilson, but the other Allied leaders want pretty much nothing to do with it. The other Allied leaders generally reject every single point of Woodrow Wilson's peace plan. And time and time again, Woodrow Wilson backs down on all these different points because he wants to preserve what he sees as the most important thing of all of it, that being the League of Nations. Because what the other Allied leaders want isn't an amicable peace plan that's good for everybody. They want, especially the French, a peace plan that punishes Germany for their role in the war. The French want to see Germany down. They want Germany kicked while they're down. And they don't want Germany getting up 
ever again. And so that's the situation that we're in as we get to January of 1919 when delegates from 27 different countries gather in Paris to work out five separate peace treaties at this Paris Peace Conference. And the Paris Peace Conference is led by the leaders of the big four nations of the Allied Powers. You've got Prime Minister David Lloyd George from Britain, French Prime Minister George Clemenceau, the oldest guy and the only one who still remembers the War of 1870 between the British and the French, uh, I mean, excuse me, the Germans and the French, and by the way, he hates Germany and really wants to see them get punished. You have the Italian Prime Minister, Vittorio Orlando, and of course, the previously mentioned U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. And uh, these guys lead the peace conference Conference, but conspicuously absent from all of this are the countries who fought on the other side of the war. None of the central powers or Russia were allowed to attend the peace conference. Russia makes sense. They made a separate peace treaty with Germany, but the Ottomans, the Bulgarians, the Germans, the Austrians, they're not allowed to attend the peace conference. So really, this is less of a peace conference and more of the allies getting together to decide what terms they're going to force upon the central powers. This is going to be a huge mistake in the long run, as we'll eventually see. And so five peace treaties were hammered out at this conference, the most important of which was the Treaty of Versailles, because this treaty specifically dealt with Germany. And remember, the French in particular want to see the Germans punished. They know Germany is down, and they want to kick them while they're down because they want to keep them down. They want to weaken Germany. They want to prevent Germany from ever being a threat ever again. And so militarily, the treaty reduces the size of the German army. The Germans are not allowed to have more than 100,000 in a standing army at any time, and the Germans are banned from building any large weapons. The treaty further forces the Germans to give up all of their colonial overseas territory and to give up uh, some of their land in Europe. The map that you see there, uh, the picture on the left shows uh, Europe prior to World War I, and the picture on the right shows Europe after the end of World War I, 1919. And you can see from the two pictures, Germany has lost some territory. You can see the Austrian Empire has been broken up into a number of smaller countries, and the land that Austria and, Russia got, uh, Austria and Germany got from Russia has now been carved up into a number of different smaller countries. So there's a territorial aspect to this, but there's also another level to it that really kind of takes the punishment of Germany to, to, to a whole other level, a whole other stratosphere. The Allies, specifically the French, demand that Germany accept full blame for causing the war. They add what's called the War Guilt Clause to the treaty. And in forcing Germany to accept full blame for the war, this makes Germany liable to have to pay reparations or monetary damages for all of the Allied war costs. And the amount of money that is slapped onto the Germans is something that doesn't seem like much to us today, but at the time was an unheard of sum, $32 billion, in American dollars anyway, and that was an unbelievable amount of money for war reparations at the time. So the goal is clearly to kick Germany while they're down and to keep them down. Now, the Germans react to this treaty uh, with resentment, as you might imagine. As a matter of fact, they don't feel like they lost the war. Uh, there was no battles on German soil. No enemies got on German soil. German industry and the economy wasn't destroyed. They're still an intact, economic, strong country. But the, the provisions of the treaty are intended to hurt and weaken Germany, and they do exactly that. The Treaty of Versailles leaves Germany weakened, humiliated, deprived of their power status as, as a great country in the world. In a lot of ways, Germany has been neutered by this treaty. And this treaty is not just embarrassing for the Germans, but the heavy reparations and, and other parts of it are going to contribute to a horrible economic depression in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. And the fact that all of these decisions in the treaty are made without the consideration of Germany is only going to lead to even more resentment. And all of the conditions of the treaty are going to create the situation in Germany that's ultimately going to allow for the rise of the Nazis and Adolf Hitler. And we know that these guys are are going to go on and start World War II. And so this treaty that was supposed to end the war to end all wars is only going to lead to a bigger, more destructive war in the future. That's where we leave it off here, guys. World War I at an end. We see that the United States' involvement in the war turns the tide and leads to the Allied victory. And with the fighting over, uh, the peace conferences in Paris try to establish some kind of peace. For the French, it's about keeping the Germans down. But ultimately, the Treaty of Versailles intended to establish that long-term peace 
is only going to really make the Germans angry and lead to another more horrible war in the future. So those are the essential questions. Guys, that's what we covered. Make sure you study those essential questions and be ready to talk about them the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.